Make sure I'm going to record. I'm making sure that it's recording so I don't fuck it up, you know? Don't want to fuck it up before we start. Want to make sure we get it so we can post it elsewhere afterwards, right? We don't want to lose it. So give me one second. So yes, as I said, I'm going to do an interview, a special interview tonight. I usually don't do interviews. I usually go solo. But uh, I'm going to start doing maybe one interview every two weeks, something like that. Uh, give some other people a voice, some other, you know, interesting people who have uh, a lot to offer, but maybe, you know, haven't been getting the recognition they deserve. And this is a person I'm going to bring her on today. Her name is Katie Fanning. And uh, I just found out about her last week. Somebody sent a link to a, a talk that she was giving in the UK and it was based. Let me tell you folks, it was based. She is red pill. When I, when I saw the link, I was like expecting it to be, uh, you know, a kind of conservative Boris Johnson type thing, milk toast. Uh, the group was called traditional Britain, I think, but let me tell you something. She knows what she's talking about. She nailed it. She nailed it in that talk. She was talking about the Marxists, the genocidal maniacs who are running the universities in the UK. It was great. So let's bring her up here. Let me let me find her. Is she down here? There she is. So let's get her on here. Katie, you there? Hi, good evening. How are you? Great to have you. Thanks for coming on. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. So I saw I saw the speech you gave. That's how I found you. Someone posted in my chat room and I looked at it and it was great. Let me tell you, it was great. It was fantastic. I, I wasn't even expecting you to to be so candid. I thought like usually when I see women, you know, in our circles, they don't speak as candidly as you did, but you really, you know, hit the nail on the head. You're talking about uh, the infiltration of the universities in the UK by the genocidal cultural Marxists and their anti-white agenda. So uh, I guess the first question I got for you is how did you end up, you know, given that speech? Where did you where did you come from? OK, so I decided to go to university to, well, study something that was going to be less vulnerable to economic downturn and AI technologies. I was working as a Lean Six Sigma analyst previously, and I didn't particularly like that. So I knew that university was going to be full of left wing Marxists. So I decided to study online, thinking I'd be able to avoid some of the you know, more crazy types and I wouldn't have to deal with all the Black Lives Matter nonsense. However, this this really wasn't the case. And, um, you know, so I started studying and I became aware that the university was pushing an awful lot of anti-white propaganda. I mean, when I joined, it was Black History Month. So nearly every link was to things about decolonization and slavery mm. and whiteness. And from there, I started to become aware that there were support services only available to black and ethnic minority students, bursary schemes to give them £1,500 a year only for black and ethnic minorities from disadvantaged backgrounds, excluding white disadvantaged students, which, by the way, are one of the mm. smallest demographics yes. going on to higher education in the UK. Massive disparity, in fact. I think that now half of universities admit less than 5% of white working class hmm. students, despite us still being a majority demographic, probably but not. Remember we, remember, we got the privilege, right? White privilege. We control everything, don't we? No, oh, yes. That's what I they mean, say. Sure, if you look at who owns the banking systems, the media, the pharmaceutical companies, I mean, all the NGOs like the World Economic Forum. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's all... It's all just white people. Oh, wait, no, no, it's no, so, it's so ridiculous, eh? White it's, people, it's, is it? They all seem to have something in common, though. It's so ridiculous how absurd the left-wing narrative is when it comes to white privilege, right? It's like there's so many examples like that you can point to of whites literally being discriminated against and shut out of universities and, and shut out of jobs just because they're white, but apparently we're in control and we have the privilege. It's so crazy. But um, in the United Kingdom, we're discriminated against in every area of life. 
I mean, we can't get yeah, our police yeah. to investigate hate crimes against us. Up to a million white British mm -hmm. school children have been raped, tortured, sold as sex slaves, some of them murdered in religiously and racially motivated hate crimes conducted by the Pakistani yeah. Muslim immigrant community. And yet the police turned a blind eye and refused to help these kids. If you look at employment, we've got equal opportunity quotas, which are anything but the anti-white man quotas. I've worked in recruitment and I know what they are. And they basically don't give the white person the job. Black and ethnic minorities come first and then maybe women after, you know, LGBT and whatever else victim group they can name ahead of us. But yeah, um, to go back to your original question, I, I basically raised my complaints with the university and rather than them actually dealing with my complaints, they subjected me to a disciplinary. And then after a tutorial where we were discussing the British Constitution and whether it should be fully codified, um, they shut that down because I said that we're changing demographics of our country. We certainly shouldn't have unwritten principles and values because they will become undermined. And apparently this was an extremist view, pointing out that women's equality before the law is being undermined by Sharia courts in the UK. That was seen as an extremist view. And I became aware that there was other white students that felt that they were being discriminated against. So I posted on a forum um, asking other white students or other students in general to come forward if they felt that they were being racially and politically discriminated against. I was subject to another disciplinary. Seeing as if we couldn't um, resolve these matters internally and I was going to be consistently hit with disciplinaries if I um, mentioned this discrimination that white students were being subjected to and the racial harassment of critical race theory based teachings that always portray whiteness in a derogatory and negative manner pretty much on a daily basis. Um, I knew these complaints weren't going to get resolved internally, so I decided that I'm going to sue them. So that's how I ended up being asked to do this talk. Because so you, it turns out there so is you no other at, at universities that's done that. Sorry. So w which university were you at? If you don't, do you want to reveal that? Or? I've been advised not yeah. to name them at this point in time, even okay. though they have actually been named in an article. And I feel that the case is going to go public, um, whether they like it or not. And so, so what, I believe that what I was the, um, it's a protected act. I can't be sued for liable for it. What was the, like, what were you taking? What were you studying? Law. And even yeah. in law, so usually I would expect, like, in the social sciences, completely dominated by these Marxists, right? But even law, you're saying, is run by these anti-whites. Even the law schools are yeah. preaching of hatred of white people. There's a massive problem with law at this point in time. I mean, um, I've I've signed up to numerous things stating that I was a black and ethnic minority just to see what they're getting offered. And there is an awful <laughs> lot of internships, right? All these internships and um, training opportunities, you know, only open to black and ethnic minorities. You can get your law degree as a white person, but you're never going to get that two year training contract that you need to become a barrister or a solicitor. There is an oath as well, I believe, that many of them have taken. This is why I've had to pursue legal action of my own accord, because it would be impossible for me to get legal aid or to be able to trust any solicitor, as they've taken oaths to be champions of diversity, meaning that right. they don't want white people using the legislation that they utilise against us to support our equality, which is the Equality Act of 2010, which is where the majority of my legal claims are being well, advanced. Even even in the police in the UK, they have special units to promote diversity. I remember seeing a story in London where they, they hired, the diversity guy that they hired ended up being one of these Muslim groomers, literally. The, the diversity hire in the police, the guy recruiting other Muslims into the police was running a fucking grooming gang. This is how crazy it's gotten over there. but. It doesn't surprise well, me, honestly. Complicit in that, our constabulary have been complicit. There's been police officers who have been charged. There was a labor lord who was also involved. They have been not only, I would say, perverting the course of justice in these crimes against humanity, but have actively been facilitating these acts of genocide. And because they know that they're guilty, especially the people who give the orders at the top, they order their corrupt constabulary. So instead, persecute victims, try to discredit and silence them. We're up against a so, state that is completely 
against the indigenous white population in every way. Yes, and it's that's the case in pretty much every European country right now, except for maybe Eastern Europe. I I looked you up a little bit. So you were part of the the U the UKIP party for a, a while, right? Yeah, I was on their board of directors, a member of the National Executive Committee. I got elected onto there in 2016 and served till 2019. It was also the I wanted to ask you. For a year. I, I wanted I wanted to ask you about UKIP because. Did you figure out at some point that UKIP was controlled opposition and was run by these Jewish, you know, shills like uh, Nigel Farage, who admitted that he set up UKIP to to um, torpedo the BMP? He admitted that on an interview. You see, when I went to UKIP, um, it's it's interesting actually. I wasn't very politically minded. I very much detested what was happening to my country, but I always thought that politicians were just pointless liars. But then I decided at one stage that I was going to dedicate my talents to removing this evil from the world. And um, UKIP was one of these uh, institutions that I came across on the Alex Jones show. He was doing an interview with um, Paul, why can I not think of his name? It'll come to Western. me. You'll, you'll know. Who is. Yeah, that's him. And he was on the Alex Jones show. And that's when I first saw Nigel Farage. Now, I disagreed with the European Union, but I can't say that I was politically aware. At this point, I disagreed with multiculturalism and completely come out of the Jewish brainwashing that I'd been subjected to, you know, from birth. And we have been for generations. But um, I believed that the first thing that we needed to do to curb this evil and funnily enough, get control of our borders, which has not happened, was getting us outside of the European Union. We can't influence our own policy and our own laws if we don't even govern ourselves. So that was stage one for me. And that's when I started to look into multiculturalism. And a realization came to me that was, well, each race, each ethnicity has their genetic innate behaviors, right? There's such thing as black culture, Asian culture. No one will deny that those exist, right? So these cult people's races, they produce these cultures, right? So you can't have multiracialism without having multiculturalism because each race has its own culture. And I realized that most of these people are very hostile towards us. Now, when I joined UKIP, I met Nigel Farage and he, he didn't seem to like me much because most people would be um, starstruck when they met him, whereas I was just a little bit angry at how the party was running its... Um, it's funding. It just didn't seem like it planned in advance and would just, you know, go to members desperately whenever our campaign turned up. So I wanted to implement a fully, you know, a full funding strategy and produced a plan and took it to him. And I think that took him back a little bit. And um, then I started to realize that the party was, you know, being governed by people or there was a lot of people in positions where they were being paid an awful lot of money to not do a lot apart from what seemed to be sabotage the party. So I decided to try and take it over in a way not completely take it over but I decided to get myself into seven different roles in fact I did that within a year and a half and got elected to the executive committee now I've always been more right than the majority of UKIPers I mean UKIP used to um, exclude people who've been members of the BMP or any other far-right organization I mean people were kicked out just for sharing a post that Britain first may have put on Facebook I mean no, no other party would do that um, Britain so first was Britain powerful. first was exactly the same kind of controlled opposition as as UKIP, but a little bit further to the right, I guess. Right? I saw UKIP as a strategy because you see, people in our society are very scared of our opinions. So if you have a more moderate version, they will go for that. Um, so sometimes. You know, it. this is why the BMP was painted as the far right and UKIP the more moderate version, because we needed that primary objective of getting out of the EU. I knew that my involvement with these parties would probably be a little bit pointless from then onwards. But my plan was when I got onto the National Executive Committee that I wanted to steer it in a direction of talking about these more controversial issues, talking about the grooming gangs, talking about demographic replacement, talking about white genocide. I mean, within the first month of me being elected to the National Executive Committee, the uh, mainstream media was threatening to write about me because I talked about white genocide online and they wanted me to apologize. And all of UKIP was like, you need to apologize. You need to apologize. The media and I, I refused to. 
And I said, well, you know, it's all factual. If they want to print the story, it'll give me a platform to talk about these issues so they can go ahead. And you could probably would have kicked me out at that point, but couldn't because I'd just been elected to the National Executive Committee with one of the highest votes the party had ever seen. So um, Hope Not Hate ended up running with the story and the mainstream media refused to because if you don't apologise, you don't back down and you can articulate your points quite well, they won't yeah. want to write about you. They don't want to draw any attention to you whatsoever. But that article yeah. from Hope Not Hate is still available online. But I do remember UKIP being, uh, you know, trying to pressure me into apologising for those statements, saying that they were far right statements. So yeah. I knew from there that, that um, some cultural adjustment was going to be needed in the party. And I attempted that by putting in Gerard Batten as leader after Henry Bolton was kicked out, because I interviewed all of these um, people who might become party leader to try and find a suitable one and then just lobbied the rest of the NEC to take on that choice. And Gerard Batten was by far the best choice anyway, and he was going to talk about the grooming gangs. It was just unfortunate that um, his dealings with Tommy Robinson and the infighting that happened within the party because of that sort of was the last straw. And at the end of that European elections that went so terribly, they literally were just, it was just a bunch of vultures trying to pick at the carcass of UKIP's rotting corpse. Didn't you have, didn't the Sargon of Akkad try to join in there and the grift at some he point? He did join. He did join. He stood for us in the Chubby um, boy. European elections. Chubby boy Sargon. Um, he he made some comments. Uh, um, basically he's, dominated the media. He's such a gatekeeper, that guy. I mean, that guy existed just to gatekeep the right wing and so did ukip really like that that's why they set up a ukip was to keep people from going too far to the right from pe keep people you were trying to push them further to the right right that's what you were trying to do but they were trying to keep everybody in the center essentially well, right? yeah, they, to keep they them away from bmp the saboteurs the people who didn't want us going too far to the right ended up you know um Semi losing the plot, actually. They kicked out the leader. The leader had just been elected on the highest vote that the party had ever seen, refused to allow their chairman to assume a position, tried to sue the party leader for turning up at the office and asking for the membership data. They lost that case, by the way. But they also kicked out me and a number of other people from the party that they considered to be far right at the same time. Yeah, it's pretty bad. I mean, I guess the BMP kind of imploded there after um, after Brexit. Is the BMP still there? It still exists or is it defunct? I believe it's still in existence. Uh, there's a number of small right wing political organizations, but mostly they spend yeah. their time arguing amongst themselves rather than focusing on the enemy. <laughs> yeah, they, it's kind of a it's kind of a shit show now, but um. But that's interesting. So you you woke up through Alex Jones, and then you kind of figured out I that white people through are the evolution of thought. Um, I think it. I think it's one of those things that waking up to all the lies and subversion it takes some time. And to be honest, you know, when it came to the JQ question, you know, I saw yeah. it was it was very difficult because you're like, right, I need to know who is who is behind all this left-wing Marxism and you start to mm. research it and you're like okay Jewish Jewish yeah. there's an awful lot of Jewish people here and then you're like bit of a pattern here. School. bit of a pattern that we can't really deny but you don't really want to admit it to yourself because you think well if I say seems to be the Jews then I must be a Nazi and they're like the worst mm. people in the world and then then you're like well then your life's over and you lose all your friends for that and you look into Dude. World War II and you look at the history of the last few centuries for the European people, for what the Russians, everything. And you're just like, oh, my goodness, I have been completely lied to my entire mm. life about everything. And then suddenly you wake up and you're like, I need to I need to do something. <laughs> Say like, something about it. Fun. Yeah, that, that was kind of like how I started. Like when I first realized, I was like, Damn, this is crazy. I've never seen anything like it. I learned about the Holocaust. I learned about Zionism and all these things that I've never seen before. They don't teach you anything like this in school or university. They keep it away from you. So it's so intriguing. And then you just want to tell other people. It's kind of like, you know, that's the natural course to take. Um, 
So when well, you so you to keep it to yourself, or I did for a while. You were like, I, you know, only with people that I thought would be open-minded. Uh, no, no, I don't. They're they're um, not highly political. I would imagine that the mother's side of the family are actually quite left-wing, or they behave as such. My family, so, like I, I. I would tell tell them all the things I was learning, right? And they would reject it. Like at first they completely rejected it. And then I just left it. You know, I didn't like try to force it on them or anything. I let them do their own research. And like a number of years later, they ended up coming around to all of it with their own research. They confirmed it themselves. So it kind of works out like that. I kind of say to people, you know, rather than getting offended, prove me wrong. Prove me wrong. Look it up yourself. Prove me wrong. Rather than just screaming at me or getting offended or saying that you can't say those things, prove the facts that I've stated wrong. And they can't. So then they go and look it all up and they're like, oh, you know, it's all right. true. See, that's the thing. They're 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 coming at it from a position of complete ignorance. They don't know any of those these facts. They haven't investigated anything yet. They're so arrogant that they're right, that their worldview is true. See that's see that's the worst part of it is this these are people that have been completely propagandized and hoodwinked and deceived and they just don't know it they really don't they think those Hollywood movies from Steven Spielberg that's the truth right but I wanted to ask you so you've been to college you you graduated from university or you're still no, going to college I'm yeah I've started at a new university unfortunately the year that I did at the university that I'm suing couldn't I couldn't move the credits over so the module that I'd studied was you know I, I basically can't use that towards my final degree so I'm having to redo that year with a new university that I started with two days ago and I've already sent them an email of complaint because the vast majority of the students inside the student forum seem to be from Africa or the Middle East and have arrived in the last two to three years um, so I've stated that I don't think I'll be able to engage on the student forums because people being on there celebrating the invasion, occupation and genocide of my nation and peoples is not something that I wish to see on a daily basis. Yeah, that's that's just typical now. Every major university filled with these people, these invaders, it's it's affirmative action. It's, you know, special scholarships. That's how it works. But I wanted to ask you this because. I'm sure you've seen, you know, some of the memes of women, you know, they when they go into college, it seems like they're normal, right? And then you have the the after photo where they have half of their hair cut off, shaved off. They got yeah. blue hair, they got mohawks, they got like spikes coming out of their nose and, and <laughs> lips. You, got you know, what's going on with them. these women? What's going on with these women in college? They're being completely fucking brainwashed and turned into like screeching harpies who want to castrate men they want to just you know destroy the white race they, they want to tear everything down what's going on with these women well women are more easy to sociologically psychologically manipulate they need to be like they need to be accepted you know, deep in the normal female brain, they understand that survival for a lone female is usually not something that is possible for most females. So they desperately need to be liked and be part of a community and a clique. I mean, the thing that females fear most is losing their relationships. So they will comply with what they think is the majority view. And then people need to understand this, that Marxism, anti-white Afrocentric Marxism includes feminism that really does target white women and it is an assault upon white women a psychological assault to convince them that men marriage settling down having babies is the enemy and that shaving their hair off making themselves as ugly as possible going out and sleeping with whoever they like and having 20 abortions before they're 40 is great and I yeah. don't know how they managed to make them fall for it. I really don't, because I just don't understand second wave feminism at all. But, you know, what I understand how university works and how women's minds work. And you can't get away from that propaganda. It is ingrained even within the course materials. So these girls, they go in at 18 years old. And I honestly believe that, well, for, for our white species of hominid, the, the brain's not fully matured until about the age of 30. But at 18 years old, with that 
easy to manipulate mind of theirs they they easily fall for all this marxist yeah. propaganda and fall into these harmful and dangerous lifestyle choices um mm. that make them hate themselves hate their family hate men and hate their society they hate everything they become nihilistic they become self-destructive they probably get into drugs they start getting it i mean literally they're it just, so it reminds hateful. me of the before and after meth photos you've seen those right you know before and after meth those before and <laughs> yeah. after you you could honestly you could swap them over and pretend that they were before well, and after meth. no one would question it it's not only do they shave off the hair but they grow out the hair have you seen it they they, they have grow hair out growing out of their fucking armpits everywhere color. it's so crazy this feminist shit has just gone off the wall it's outrageous you know i've experienced it just the vast majority of women have swallowed the poison pill of feminism and even the ones who are pretty normal they're still very very liberal i'd say like the majority of women are going to be liberal because that's the dominant culture and women tend to follow the dominant right culture to mm -hmm. reclaim femininity and womanhood as our own our natural roles and our place in the world we're women stop making us be men we don't want to be you know you think i think the, it's time that we had an anti-feminist revolution it's definitely i mean feminism is the main cause of our demise because of the birth rates the birth rates are rock bottom and the reason for that is because of feminism women aren't having children they just don't want them so I think that's like the first thing that has to be dismantled. And as, as he said, that's part of cultural Marxism. That was like one of the main tenets of it because they wanted to dismantle the patriarchy and the family and all of that stuff. Feminism plays perfectly into that sequence. So um, do you think, though, just women like they, they all, they've been taught that they have to go to college and they have to get a career like that's like every woman believes that today in the west like, i don't well, see hardly any women that don't do that they all go to college right i think that um a lot of women because they don't meet an awful lot of men that would uphold the traditional lifestyle i think that a lot of women feel that having their own career and their own income gives them independence and would prevent them from becoming abused by their partner if they were financially dependent upon them now this is just you know a matter of finding you know not not marrying non-decent men but a lot of women do have this whole idea that the sex in the city lifestyle is the best lifestyle and also having that independence to save them from these evil men um is the best thing for them they've been convinced that uh independence freedom uh, like hobbies and and pleasures and pursuits is is the way to go they want their freedom right they've been told these these feminists these marxist feminists in universities teach them that children are parasites they literally say that i've heard these feminists say that a baby in your womb is a parasite um, there's so poison against motherhood and that was like you know the linchpin attack against our race against our civilization was convincing women not to have any children and then they tell us oh they're not having any children so we got to replace them with immigrants right we're gonna we need more workers we need people to pay the pension so just bring in all the africans you see how they do it oh yeah like destroy the women destroy the natural role of women then you destroy family destroying the family destroys society and that is their end goal well, our society, they would like to replace us with low IQ sub-Saharan Africans and random third world primitives. And they are they're well on their way to doing that, like that um, that that brown bitch, uh, Ash Sarkar. You heard of her? Uh, yeah, no, she she's like uh, no, she, she said she said uh, she ha she's on a video where she's like. The white population has gone down by 600,000, but the browns have gone up 1.2 million. We're winning, lads. That was a that was a mask off moment, and that was great propaganda for us, honestly. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't understand why these um, non-white invaders to our lands are so confident. They must think that because they're here now that they can't be removed. 
I assure you, we're going to remove millions of them. I will start by removing all the people that came here illegally. Then I will go on to the peoples that have committed crimes or the foreign criminals. But the main part is, is once I'm done with suing our current government, past and present, and all those that are complicit in their acts of genocide against the indigenous white population, we will have a review and we will revoke the citizenships that have been granted to any foreign national since the 1900s that has been deemed to be granted as an illegal act of genocide. They will have their citizenships revoked. They will have six months to leave and get their affairs in order. If they haven't left by then, they will be forced to leave. And if they leave peacefully, we'll reimburse them for the property that we seize. If they don't leave peacefully, they won't be reimbursed for the property that we seize because we'll use that to fund our land army, which will carry out this repatriation program whilst defending the indigenous white population from any attacks that these primitives might want to commit because they've been asked to leave our home. That They're sounds going. like a very good, meticulous plan. That sounds pretty good. Oh, I got you put, put it in. Detail. I'm going to create a whole nationalist manifesto. <laughs> that's good. That's that's what we need. Um, the U the UK. I mean, it's it's got to be one of the worst country, the white countries to be in right now. Uh, the the hate speech laws there are outrageous. I've seen people arrested for misgendering transsexuals on Twitter and, you know, um, talking, there was a guy who was arrested recently for, you know, talking bad about blacks who, you know, how they, they missed all the penalties in the Euro cup and all these yeah. Englishmen, drunk Englishmen were like, fuck these blackies. And they're getting arrested. These guys, it's crazy. Yeah. What's um, going on over there? Well, what happens in every single Marxist revolution or Marxist takeover? Recently, they seem to um, have really got themselves out of control, especially since this whole COVID thing and think that no laws apply to them. They can just do whatever they like. I mean, now they're actually introducing legislation that will put you in jail for two years if you question the vaccine program. Yeah. No. Um, yeah. I mean, I don't believe that this is going to be um, sustainable for them they would have to start building an awful lot more prisons and our peoples are waking up at an exponential rate and i do believe that there is a pressure cooker moment and things are going to boil over and it might take a very long time through their slow march through the institutions to get where they are a revolution mm. to remove them from their positions of insidious power will not take anywhere near as long less than six months and we'll have half of them there, in prison facing Allegations so arrogant. Of humanity. They are the extremely people in arrogant. power. People in power, they are drunk on their power right now. Like this, the things that they're coming out with now with these COVID restrictions and they're beating down old women, old ladies in the street, they're choking them. This is a this is a social experiment. They're they're just testing us, they're prodding us to see how much tyranny we put up with, how much out how many outrages we we tolerate before we get sick of it and fight back. That's what this is like a test run for a global government, right? They're gonna put put people in camps. They're already doing that, COVID camps. They got them. They got them in Australia. They got them in Canada. So they're probably gonna create like new uh, wrong think camps. I'm sure that's coming. They're building a gigantic prison complex outside a town called Wellingborough in the United Kingdom very large prison complex. Um, well, we know these things happen with Marxists, you know, genocides and gulags. So it's it's to be expected. The only thing is, is that so many of our people are in denial. For me, I'm kind of like, you have this small window of opportunity to stop these psychopaths, but yet you will mm. stick your head in the sand in a state of denial, wishing mm. to put on your rose tinted glasses and pretend it's not happening. And I find it most frustrating, to be honest, but there's not much I can do when people are refusing to acknowledge the problem. Do you think those people, like those very liberal, left-wing, progressive whites, do you think it's just a lost cause that they're just going to get swept away? They're just they're going down with the, the crashing, burning system. And it's kind of, I kind of see it as like um, a genetic culling process. The weak people in our race they're just going to get run over and we can't save everybody you know well 
these globalists have been planning for a very, very long time. Now, I believe what's going on right now is certainly a live exercise. It's not necessarily their full plan of what they wish to do. They are running a live exercise. However, this idea that the vaccination program or that they're going to kill off all the liberals is ridiculous. They know that people like myself exist and the only protection that they have is the masses that currently believe them. If they weren't there protecting the psychopaths that are holding them hostage, then good people like ourselves would arrest these billionaire psychopaths and put them in prison and make them stand trial in a people's court. But unfortunately, they have these drone masses. Now, why would they get rid of the compliant drones? Why would they want to kill them off? They're always going to need some level of servants and people to lord over, and they're going to need um, the ones that are the most compliant. Doesn't make sense mm. to get rid of them. All. So, and with this whole, what they're doing right now, I've noticed recently they've allowed me back onto Facebook of all places. Um, and I've been posting my normal content. I've recently posted a video that's made by three white girls. I think they actually might come from Canada. I think it's the blonde lady might do Red Wave. And it's talking about how there is a war on white women and it calls out the Jew on it and it's not been taken down. And what worries me is, you know, when they are trying it to will be, don't worry. <laughs> I know in their heads that they know there is an opportunity for us to take them down. Otherwise, they wouldn't still be scared of the things that we're saying. Their confidence mm. levels are getting so high that now they don't even hide any of this. So are they yeah. so sure that their plan is going to succeed, that they're getting that cocky? Or are they kind of jumping the gun a little bit and that they're going to mess up because they're going to awaken the masses before they can implement their full plan of control? Mm -hmm. we'll see. They're, they're taking a big, they're really taking a big gamble with this, this acceleration that has happened over the past year or so with this COVID stuff and just the outrageous acceleration of the anti-white rhetoric with this BLM riots that have taken place over That's the past year. That's a lot of people up. Poor, pulling down the statues or even doing that UK I saw in the UK um what's his name that that negro actor that was on a megaphone he was ranting about white privilege and stuff he, he was in Star Wars you know that guy no but we have africans ranting all the time about white privilege <laughs> they just stick them on the common the, thing on, as long as they hate white people they they'll they'll get you know they put on bbc and, they're put on BBC to talk about white privilege. So we have the Negro, the anti-white Negroes getting put on television to bash white people and talk about killing white people, which is there's clips of a Negress um, in the UK talking about killing white people on television. But she was just joking, though. But, uh, oh. you know, if a white man, a white oh. man went and said that there was a tranny, there was a transgender black um, dude from the UK that said the white race is the most evil race and that person didn't get fined or sued or anything. See, this is, this is it. There was even a Twitter hashtag that was trending of kill all white men. There was a woman called Baha Mustafa and she um, banned all white students. She was an employee at a university, banned all white students from attending meetings about discrimination and racism, saying that they wouldn't be able to have open discussions with their oppressors in the room but she feels <laughs> comfortable enough to go on a public platform like twitter and say kill all white men and they do this quite a lot i mean what do people think that critical race theory is this is why i'm trying to take out critical race theory with my legal case stating that it is actually an act of racial harassment because it's unwarranted conduct mm -hmm. related to race that creates an intimidating hostile and degrading atmosphere for white students, which is a contravention of the Equality Act of 2010. Now, critical yeah. race theory teaches that all white people are racist and oppressive from the moment of birth, and that our existence of whiteness needs to be abolished. And that could only, of course, be done by eradicating white people. What they are doing is teaching an ideology of white genocide alongside the inaccurate yeah. disseminations of our history meant to stir up racial animosity towards the indigenous white populations. And this yeah. is why universities need to be curbed, because here in the United Kingdom, these 
primitive children that they're bringing over from Africa, the Middle East, are now going to make the majority of the students that are in our schools. And if they didn't hate us before, the Marxists are certainly going to teach them to hate us with critical race mm -hmm. theory. You can only be free if you kill all white people, abolish whiteness. How do you think that they're going to interpret that? And they're being told that, oh, white people are guilty for all the world's ills. And the only reason why you've never been able to get anywhere in life is because of these white people. What do people think is going to happen when we are a minority in our own country to these peoples who are being taught to hate us? It doesn't take a genius to work out what the end result is if we do not curb this now. That's why I'm taking them to court. It's it's going to end like South Africa, where they're it's murdering like people, murdering white people openly on their farms, where they're chanting, kill the boar, kill the white man. And they have political political leaders down there talking about how they're going to genocide white people when the time comes. That's what we have in store if we keep going down this path. It's so funny. They, you know, they talk about whiteness and white people, yet these same lunatics say there's no such thing as race. Race doesn't matter. See, race doesn't exist except when we want to guilt trip the white man, except when we want to demoralize the white man and convince him to show uh -huh. deference to black people, right? To show it's deference right. to the invaders. With races don't exist. There is no such thing as races. It's a ridiculous thing. We are actually, in fact, different hominid species. We have completely different <laughs> genetic composition from completely different um, hominid forefathers. For instance, you know, sub-Saharan Africans share 20% of their genetic con uh, makeup with an extinct archaic hominid, super archaic hominid, most likely yeah. Homo erectus. That that genetic composition is completely absent in white Europeans and Asians. Homo erectus. These different yeah, races homo, are in fact little, different modern species of hominid. We're not all little Homo erectus species. is running around. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if our forefathers, the Cro-Magnon, had not gone around and uh, decided to create their worker race by sleeping with these simian-like hominids in Africa, thus creating the sub-Saharan Africans, then you wouldn't have these different species of hominid. They're not different races. Mm. Where else do you get races in the animal kingdom? I mean, the nearest thing you've got is domesticated animal breeds like dogs and cattle, but they actually all come from one common ancestor, whereas modern humanity does not. So I agree with the left on that. We're not different races. We don't have one <laughs> common ancestor. We species. have different hominid species, completely different hominid mm. species different genetic composition, different physical, uh, well, cognitive attributes, different genetic innate behaviors. We're just different species by any classification. There's as much difference between us and sub-Saharan Africans as there is between wolves and jackals. Well, we're certainly, I mean, you could say we're subspecies. I mean, they, they would just say, oh, well, you wouldn't be able to reproduce with them if they were completely different species, but that's certainly people already accept cert that we are two percent neanderthal thus we are able to make with different hominid species yeah Otherwise, we wouldn't certainly exist. certainly they're very much different from us and those differences are profound despite what the left says that we're all the same and it's just skin color i mean i've had many debates with these leftists on that topic and it always just comes back to this nonsense that it's just the appearance. That's the only difference between people. But, you know, it, why is it that you have to bring Africans into a white environment just to raise their IQ up like five points? I think that in itself proves that we have these superior genetics in that respect, because you, you wouldn't see that. You wouldn't need to bring blacks into a white environment to increase their standard of living or increase their intelligence or increase anything. They would be able to do that themselves. In, though, is it? Because when you have a quality in outcome, a quality that's enforced throughout all areas of life, you can't make people as equally good at things, can you? You can only make people as equally bad at things. So what they're doing mm -hmm. is actually dragging down the standards of our nation, particularly with our IQs, because they're bringing in these sub-Saharan Africans mm -hmm. and these white women that end up having children with sub-Saharan Africans and have mixed race kids. Now there is 30 years of study on this between genetics and IQ. It has been proven to drop the average IQ of their children by about 20 points. 
So what they're doing is dumbing down the population yeah. of Europe so that they will become a easier governable mass. They don't mind having okay. mixed race peoples because they're never going to be able to develop the technologies to overcome the technologically imposed tyranny that they're going to plan to impose upon us with social scoring systems and surveillance mm. and all of these things. Africans couldn't even manage to invent the wheel, for goodness sake. How are they going to invent anything that's going to overcome that? But the, but the white mm. Europeans certainly could, which is why we need eradicating and replacing. Yeah, we're, we're the competitor group to the Jews, so they have to eliminate us and not those other people. Those other people are not a threat to them. They know that for a fact, so that's why they want to clergyize us and mix us all up and mash us all up into this mongrelized mutt race, and then they can rule over us while they stay pure over in Israel, right? They don't have any race mixing going on over there. They, they know what's going on. It's just insane what's what's happening to our people, but uh, I think we're winning. I'm not black pilled like a lot of people get black pilled about it and they get depressed. I'm really not that way, and I like that you're pretty positive and you have a pretty positive attitude about things. And you, honestly, you're you're fighting them in your own way through the legal system or whatever. But do you think it's do you think it's worth it to do that? Do you, don't you think people would say it's just totally rigged? and you can't really beat them through the legal system anyway, so we should just focus on something more practical? Uh, judiciary, there has been a massive disparity in the outcomes in our civil laws and in our criminal courts. You can see this as well in the United States of America. Look at how they're treating Kyle Rittenhouse in comparison to that Simp Simpson kid, the black lad that walked into a yeah. school and shot four children. He was out within 24 hours. Uh, and yeah, uh, now they're just trying to prosecute this Kyle Rittenhouse. And you see that when you have a disparity in our laws, that maybe it isn't the best thing going through our courts. However, I think it's going to be very difficult to actually disprove my claims. I mean, they, they are attempting to get it thrown out before it hits court, but I don't think they're going to be able to do that. Um, I think that one of the reasons they don't want my claim getting to court is because I have, well, advanced claims that if they are successful is going to ban critical race theory throughout our education systems it'll be considered a act of um harassment underneath the equality act of 2010 but another point is that one of my legal claims is that i have been discriminated against due to my factual and philosophical beliefs when i was subjected to a disciplinary for calling black lives matter a terrorist organization and and this is under the granger versus nicholson case law that i've raise this legal claim now what they'll have to do is discuss the facts of whether black lives matter meets the criteria as a terrorist organization now if a court of law upholds yeah. that that is a factual belief then our parliament is going to be forced to discuss whether black lives matter needs prescribing as a terrorist mm -hmm. organization so if i win we're getting black lives matter prescribed and hopefully critical race theory banned throughout our education system and also the white working class which are one of the smallest demographics that are going on to higher education they won't be able to exclude us or discriminate against us in any sort of initiatives that are supposed to increase participation they won't be able to have black and ethnic minority only scholarships and bursary schemes mm -hmm. that discriminate against socioeconomically disadvantaged white people anymore so yeah that's not, not that's like my case much yeah, that's good. I mean, that that could really set a precedent. And um, there are situations in the past where people have gone to the courts and uh, not necessarily willingly, but for example, Ernst Zundel, I don't know if you heard of him in Canada. He was a German guy who was questioning the Holocaust and publishing books and the Jews took him to court many times and he fought them in court and he literally disproved a lot of the Holocaust claims in court. Like they cross-examined right. the Holocaust survivors, they cross-examined Holocaust historians and disproved many of the claims in court. And that was a huge victory for revisionism. So really what you're doing is worthwhile to some extent. Um, did, did you mind, I don't know how much time you have. Um, did you mind taking, did you want to take a few questions from the audience or how much That's time do you got left? People can ask questions if they like. I've, I've just stuck my phone on on charge as we were speaking before so I, I can carry on for a little while if you like all right we'll take we'll take a couple questions for um for katie so if you have a question put your hand up and 
keep it to a question or a short comment. We're going to go on for maybe about 10, 15 minutes more. So put your hands up now. See who we got here. Do we have any people? Okay, we're going to go with this guy. Nobody's raising their hand. They're all shy, Katie. They don't want to. They don't want to ask any questions. Okay. Let's see here. Usually, we, people have got some questions, but maybe I was just very clear on on what I was communicating. <laughs> you've you've laid it all out for them. Yeah, we I got have one here. Fun. Marty, go ahead. Marty, Ooh. you there? Oh wait, there we go. Yeah, he's not saying anything. Oh, I was muted. Um, uh, apologies. You can hear me now, I hope. Yeah, yes. go ahead. Yeah, uh, it's not so much a question, but I uh, just wanted to say, well done, Katie. Uh, a breath of fresh air. Not everybody's crazy in this world. Well done. And well done to you too, Martinez. Keep the flag flying. Take it easy. Thanks, man. Thanks. Thank Appreciate you. that. It has been a pleasure. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I appreciate your um, your bravery. Aren't you afraid though that you know you could get in some hot water for some of these things you're saying in the UK? I, you're you're very brave. You're you're staunch in your beliefs. But in the UK, many people tread on, you know, thin ice, and they try to watch what they say. Are you worried about these these uh, Marxists in the government going after you? They already have done before. Um, I would say that I've been subjected to some of the more severe forms of persecution. I mean, I've not spoken about it on here, but I was one of the survivors of these Muslim paedophile rapist gangs. And when I tried to seek justice through our corrupt constabulary, they, well, conducted a two year long campaign of persecution of basically kidnapping me, saying it was for my welfare and then stripping me and beating me and throwing me in a cell and trying to claim that I'm crazy to discredit and silence me because I was talking about these crimes being religiously and racially motivated acts of genocide. And um, it turns out they really didn't like somebody doing that, especially someone who's on the board of directors of one of the biggest anti-establishment parties of the UK. So they attempted to have me put away under a hospital order, which is like going away to a psychiatric hospital, but as a criminal. And this was for a public order offence of causing somebody offence by my words. They wanted to lock me away for up to five years. Now, I managed to get all of these claims thrown out on absolute discharges, but I am fully aware of just how evil and underhand our government is. And um, I understand the danger that I'm putting myself in by doing this. However, mm -hmm. I have pledged to do this. I have an inherited duty passed down by my forefathers and I will not, I will not give up on that. I have to do this. I am compelled to mm -hmm. do it. As soon as you understand what has been done to our people, what is happening and what the likely future is, I think nothing is more important than fighting for the future of our people. I need to wake them up before it's too late to the genocide that's taking place. I need to get rid of yeah. that tonight. That is my job. That is my duty. So even if it well gets said. even if well it said, I mean, have to put up with it because well, our forefathers ran we, into machine gun fire for goodness sake. You know, we we, we right. can at least stand up and talk. It's now or never. I mean, we're at that point. We're at that precipice where, you know, in a few short years, 10 years, you know, we're going to be minorities in, in our big cities. We already are. We're already minorities in our big cities. And we're seeing what's coming down the pike. It's BLM. It's riots. It's uh, anti-white attacks. It's anti-white hate speech on the media and in academia. Things aren't going to be going any in any direction other than towards destroying our people so we have to fight anyone who's aw awoken to this it's their duty to fight and do what you can personally to fight so i guess my last question for you is um uh, how do you how do we get women uh back in the kitchen given given birth to the white babies we need to be able well I, we need to be able to implement i would say 
a more national socialist sort of system where women don't have to go to work, where, you know, we don't have Jewish bankers taxing the hell out of our people to send foreign aid out to these hostile nations. I'm sure if we regained control over our nations and stopped the propaganda that's taking place, then most women would like to return to their natural roles. Why would you want to work serving other people all day? Um, it just doesn't yeah. make sense serving, to me. Serving Jewish oligarch <laughs> anti-white who, 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 uh, who, who, homeschooling your kids. It's like they're going to work and they're, it might be okay sending them to school. Yeah. They're, they're going to work for these giant corporations and banks and stuff and, and the government and, and public schools where they're being taught and, and having to go through diversity training programs that teach them that they're evil and they just go along with it. Right. Cause they don't want to lose their job. They don't want to lose their place in society. So they go along with it. Those people are absolute cowards, you know, who do that. You don't speak I would up. do the whole retreating to the kitchen, but I, I figure that I've got a job to do. Whilst the majority of the men in this country are refusing to acknowledge what's happening, um, until they step up and do their jobs, I'm kind of being forced to be more vocal. Mm. As soon as they yeah. wake up to their manliness and start doing what nature intended, I'm quite happy to bugger off back to the kitchen and let the men do their thing. <laughs> All right, I appreciate you coming on. Katie, you're brave, you're outspoken, you're doing great work. Um, I posted your um, your talk at Traditional Britain on my channel. I'm going to post a link. You have a Telegram channel, so I've, I've seen it. I do. I do. It's not very active because I'm not really a content creator. A lot of the time I'm trying to mm. implement solutions, but there will be the first episode, which is about the Afrocentric Marxism and the action that I'm taking against it, because if other peoples are coming up against the same thing in their universities, I want to be able to teach them, if they're students, they haven't got much financial liability, how they can pursue action themselves and how to avoid the pitfalls that I've come across along the way so that we can get people more actively opposing this anti-white agenda in our education system, in our employment, even throughout our NHS. I want to get people able to, to challenge it, basically. But oh, I, yeah, I won't even, the even content. It will be like an hour long video. Even the NHS, yeah, I saw that video of uh, them saying, without these brown people, there will be no NHS, right? And they're showing you the, the nice faces of the brown nurses. Oh, apparently they built the NHS. But what's even worse, did you not know this? They, they're spending £7 million of taxpayers' money on equality diversity and inclusivity projects they're paying some africans like a hundred thousand pounds a year to write articles on the national health services website telling white people to feel uncomfortable around black people if they talk about race and that we're to sit down right. be quiet and shut up when black people well, are talking about race seven they're, million they're, pounds yeah. taxpayers money through our health service to push anti-white propaganda this is why we need That's to be standing why. up and not only that, they're using your tax money to put up these migrants uh, in hotels. That's the latest thing. And Brexit didn't stop that. It, it's still happening. Boris Johnson is a piece of shit. He's just the same globalist scum. He's anti-white, but, he, but he, he, he admitted on a video, there's a clip of him admitting on a video that when anti-Semitism pops up, then he feels like a Jew, right? He harkens back to his like Jewish great grandfather or something like that. You know, he yeah. he pulls out that card. He pulls out that card when he wants to, uh, you know, get some clout. He knows who runs the show, doesn't he? You you want you know about the Sabbatean Frankists, don't you? And the conversion of the million Jews back in 1666 and Sabbatai Zevi and the conversion to Islam. Well, what you have in Turkey, where is Boris Johnson's lineage? down the male line comes from is people called the Sabbatean Domma. So they're Jewish conversos that actually still practice Sabbateanism, but pretend to be Muslims. And this is well known in Turkey. And yeah. we believe that that is where Boris Johnson's lineage comes from. Ali Kamal, his great granddad, was actually murdered by a angry mob for his um, pushing of liberalist ideals um, hmm. in Turkey. Well, yeah. You can you can tell when Boris Johnson does a side angle photo, you can see the 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 beak on him, right? 
And he wrote an article like a few years ago where he was praising the Moorish occupation of Spain. And he was saying it was great, great culture that they brought to our lands and mosques. He's he is the ultimate Trojan horse, that guy. I mean, it's disgusting, but that's just the standard across the white world. But anyway, I'm going to post your link uh, on my main channel, on both of my channels. Hopefully you get more followers. Everyone listening right now, please go subscribe to her. What's your channel called? Um, Bubba Kate versus the state. I have an online alias of Bubba Kate Paris, and I just like the name of Bubba Kate versus the state because each episode could be called like Bubba Kate versus the state of white genocide denial, Bubba Kate versus the state of higher education or anti-white Marxist education, these sorts of things. I'm sure you get, you're going to have plenty of content to work with. There's an endless <laughs> amount of stuff to, to talk about. So thank you so much, Katie. I appreciate it. You're fighting a good fight. You're a, you're a British hero and a white hero, Aryan. So thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for listening. This has been a special interview with Martina's Perspective. Have a great night, everyone. I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you.